<laughs> it's your area of expertise. They both have incredible backgrounds, which I'm just going to read you a little bit um, from their bios, and then they're going to tell you uh, sort of more personally what some of this means. But um, Laurie Leach has been a clinical trainer, researcher, and orga organizational consultant for over 25 years. She's the co-founder of Threshold Glo Global Works and of Trauma Resource Institute. She's co-developed models of intervention that provide stabilization skills training in neuroscience-based trauma programs um, for use with children, uh, with adults and children suffering from long-term and acute trauma as well as war zone trauma. Um, and then Lori Sutton is a retired Army Brigadier General, uh, a psychiatrist whose culminating military assignment involved serving as the founding director of the Defense Centers of Excellence for Psychological Health and Traumatic Brain Injury. Um, and she's committed to empowering others. She has more than 25 years of leadership experience encompassing a diver diverse mix of domains, civilian, military, combat, and peacekeeping. Um, and uh, it's just, I, it brings to mind a little bit for me some of the work that we heard about from William Spear related to trauma. Um, so this would be nice complimentary um, information and take it away, ladies. I'd love to hear about your work. Thank you. Gosh, and I'm really impressed and grateful to you all that you're here at your last class of the semester. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to go back way too many years to remember that actually from a body level, but um, I imagine that you're pretty worn out and looking forward to having a three-week break. So thanks for being here and we're going to do our very best to make it worth your while. So Lori and I are going to each introduce ourselves a little bit more in terms of how we end up doing what we're doing. An editor of mine once said, is there a hell hole you haven't been to? Which is an unfortunate way to name the places I was going to, but they essentially were places where there had been catastrophic trauma of one kind or another. And even though, you know, people will say, well, how did you get interested in trauma? It wasn't ever really trauma that I was interested in. It was really resilience. And so to go places that were facing the sort of worst trauma and see the resilience of people is really inspiring and humbling and all kinds of other things and really keeps you very eager to do that kind of work. So we're each going to talk a little bit with you about what that personal journey was like of how we ended up where we did because um, what has certainly been true in my life, and I think you maybe less so in yours, but I didn't set out to do what I'm doing now. I, I didn't really set out to do much of what I thought except that I knew I wanted to try to make a difference, but I wasn't sure how it would happen. And by the time I was in my 30s, um, I was doing a bunch of things like research and doing uh, training in uh, clinicians who had a particular brand of therapy they were learning, and I thought, gosh, everything feels sort of fragmented. I don't know whether any of you have ever had that feeling at a certain point of, well, I really like this, and I really like this, and I really like this, and I'm doing a little bit of all of them, but am I just sort of being a dilettante? And Where's the coherence? And, and sometimes the coherence doesn't make itself known. What's that thing about counting back the dots backwards? Oh, Steve that? Jobs, uh, in his commencement address at Stanford, some of you may have heard it, it's really well worth looking up. And he talks about how really the only way to connect the dots in life is by, by looking back. <laughs> Once you've lived a bit of life, to look back and see how things have come together in ways that you couldn't have imagined or contrived or controlled or made happen going forward. Yeah. So, so we're going to talk about our little individual paths and in terms of the big archetypal scheme of what, what we're all on the planet to do, what life we're here to live. And we'll talk to you a little more specifically about the model that we use when we go into places, the model that we've used to go into traumatic settings like natural and human caused disasters. But also then we'll talk about the systems level template that we developed thanks to a fellowship from Rockefeller Foundation uh, where, we learned, where we applied to um, use a neuroscience template to look at systems. So to, how, how can we take what we know about how the brain and the body work 
and apply it to a system of any kind of size, like this system. It can be a village. It can be in an internally displaced persons camp. Right now we're working in Boston to develop a, a group of uh, resilient neighborhoods. So there are lots of kinds of systems and hospital systems. There's a lot of interest in this work in hospital systems. So I'm going to be talking to you about the individual level work we've done, and Lori's going to talk to you about the systems level work. And the handout you got is the systems level handout, and then we'll also give you um, the individual level one as well. So for me, I was happily going along in my life, living in Washington, D.C. I had a private practice. I'm a psychologist. It, you know, it was uh, lucrative. I loved it. It was interesting to me. I did research on the side. I was doing program evaluation. And let me just put in a plug for research, because any of you who learn how to do research, you're marketable in a way that really gives you a leg up. So it just, I was never good with math, and I somehow a faculty member in my PhD program asked me to be a research assistant for her, and she just said she'd teach me. And so then I ended up with a, with a specialty in quantitative research methods, and I had to repeat Algebra two in high school. So if I could do it, anybody could do it. But what it did is it helped me understand how to look at the results of research and know, is this even kind of research that holds water, because there's a lot that you can say with numbers that, that kind of distorts the truth. And the way we frame researchable questions is subjective. It's not objective, even though we like to pretend that research is objective. So I was going along doing research on the side and having my private practice in Washington, DC. Had a really stable life. I was dead center in my comfort zone. <laughs> it feels really good there, you know? No challenges, really. You're enjoying yourself, but nothing is particularly stretching. And then uh, September 11th happened. And for me, and I think a lot of people, it was a, an act that sort of cracked through complacency. It cracked through denial. It, it just something happened that shifted in me and I decided that what I had always wanted to do was try to make a sort of bigger difference and so I moved to New Mexico I, I left sold my house left my practice left a long-term relationship I, I really just completely wrenched myself away from outside talk about no comfort zone <laughs> and there I was and I took a training that really tr changed everything for me and it was a three-year, very expensive clinical training in mind, a, a particular way of working with the mind and the body. And what I realized as I, as I went through that program is that the people who could afford to take the training um, were mostly white, middle-class people in private practice. And those were not the people that I wanted to work with. I wanted to work with people in the trenches, working at the grassroots level in agencies where they didn't make very much money, with people who were really struggling. And so a colleague, and as a part of my training, I got asked to go to Thailand after the tsunami. And I began to see resilience in the face of such horror, really, and massive loss. And so a friend who was on that team, I didn't know her before we left, she and I developed a very brief training similar to the one that we'd taken, only also different, but building on that training, so that it was three days. It meant it was affordable for people in terms of time and in terms of money. And then we started um, taking it all around the world. Not because we tried, really, but because people heard about it and they realized that when you work with the mind-body system, when you work with the nervous system, which is the focus of our work, everybody has one, no matter where in the world they are. We're wired the same way, no matter what culture you come from, no matter what gender you are. Um, how different cultures interpret symptoms can be different depending on their cultural belief systems, but the symptoms that they experience are largely the same. And so we could take our model uh, all kinds to all kinds of far-flung places, which is a nicer way of saying hellholes, right? <laughs> uh, to all kinds of far-flung places like Rwanda, 
We worked there 14 years after the genocide, went into the Kigali prison and worked with the genocide dares, as well as working with people who were genocide survivors. And we've gone, you know, I won't name all the places, but just to a lot of places like that, and found that we could teach people how to use the skills themselves. And so that became the other big motivation for me is this concept that comes from Gandhi that's called appropriate technology. And appropriate technology is a technology that ordinary people can use that doesn't make them dependent on systems they have no control over. Now, isn't that a beautiful concept? Yeah. So for Gandhi, it was the sewing machine and the bicycle. He considered those examples of appropriate technology. But we, as when I read that, I read it and I just thought, well, that's what our skills are because what we decided to do is to have a clinical model that people who are clinicians would use for working through um, traumatic stress with people, sometimes incident by incident or not, but working it through versus having a model that non-clinical people could use for their own self-care and also for the care of others in their community, for their children. Children can use the skills. They're very simple and easy to use, even though they're very profound because they draw on this amazing design. You all are interested in design. This amazing design principle in the human brain and other brains as well called neuroplasticity which means that we have the capacity to change the way our brain is wired. And you know what does it? What you pay attention to. So what you pay attention to wires your brain because the neurons that fire together wire together. So that if you learn in our model to shift your attention between states inside your body that are uncomfortable to places in the body that are less uncomfortable, neutral, or even positive, you can begin through a practice of attention that's not meditation, but through a practice of attention, you can begin to rewire your brain. And so that's what we do when we go into these various places to work at the individual level. So we now, about two disasters after Thailand, we thought, you know, it's not enough to just go in and do treatment with people. We need to be teaching people how to use these skills so that when we leave, we're not just, that everything doesn't just grind to a halt. So we developed a train the trainer program. This was through my, my nonprofit, Trauma Resource Institute. We developed a train the trainer program so that any place that we went, we would train local people as trainers, which is different. You know, it's different to teach something than it is to use something. Because teaching skills require sort of another layer of skill, like understanding group dynamics and your impact on a group and all kinds of things. So we have this train the trainer model so that our goal really is to render ourselves uh, obsolete. Render ourselves out of <laughs> right. I was going to say useless, but somehow that didn't sound a little harsh. <laughs> so that's what we do. So we go in, we orient people to the skills, we give them the training, we select from the people who are trained, a group of people who are interested in being trainers, we train them as trainers, and then we, we uh, provide support um, to them. And that's how our individual model has gone. And we've done that now. Uh, Lori and I have continued to do it since I left my nonprofit and we started the for-profit uh, Threshold Global Works together. Um, we're still doing that individual model, but thanks to our Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship, we, um, we expend, expanded the lens beyond individuals to how do we intervene at the systems level to look at patterns of regulation and dysregulation in a system. So, you know, what, what got me interested about uh, tonight and talking with you all is this concept that I came across called 21st century citizenry. And what do we mean, what kinds of citizens do we need to grow in order to adapt to the rapid changes, the unpredictability, the interconnectedness 
of today's world, which is becoming increasingly complex in many ways. I mean, now there's this new thing called the Bitcoin. There's going to be a whole new currency, you know, that it, it, I just, when I read it, and this is, I guess, a product of being older, I just thought, <laughs> it's too much change too fast. You know, what about the good old days where we could just use money, cash money? Um, so lots of things are changing. And what, is, what do you think some of the qualities are that we need to, to become uh, 21st century citizens? And what do we even mean by a citizen? What, where do we put our loyalty when we're in a global world? Where does our loyalty even lie? Any thoughts that any of you have? I mean, it's pretty, it's just pretty, this concept of 21st century citizen really captured my attention. So I was interested in what you all had to, had to think about it or say about it. What does it mean to even be a citizen? What are you a citizen of? The world. And so if you're a citizen of the world, uh, how do you need to equip yourself so that you feel a sense of efficacy, so that you feel a sense of belonging, so that you feel a sense of safety? What does it take to equip yourself to be a 21st century citizen? I think you need like, to form your identity within yourself and mm -hmm. then you can sort of <coughs> identity, but so often people miss that step, and then they end up suffering because of it. I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I think. And you're saying they miss the step of of creating their own like self worth. Uh huh. First. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Well, what do you think about this notion in terms of identity and self worth and connectedness about the ways that. Uh, <coughs> We all communicate nowadays with texts, and um, I read an article recently where this group of the college students decided that when, as long as there were seven at the dinner table and three of them were off their device, the rest of them could check their devices. <laughs> so they, had, they had a little rule that okay, because then the conversation keeps going, and then after you've checked your device, you can hop back into the conversation, usually just with a little, you know, wait a minute, what was that? What did you say about that? I mean, does that promote greater, um, what you're talking about, knowledge of self? Uh, can it? No. <laughs> There's one vote for no. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I've been thinking about this a lot. I just wrote an article on this. The three qualities I was I suggest in the article to improve the quality of our conversations mm -hmm. right now, our presence, spontaneity, and empathy. So I would offer those as some qualities that twenty first century citizens should have, mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. for practice. And then the other one that I want to add to the mix is skepticism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I've been doing some research with millennials mm -hmm. and something that came up that was very interesting was this um, quality of skepticism and it being a good thing, just questioning, mm -hmm. you know, having a healthy questioning, doubting almost, but, you know, in a productive way, yeah. kind of mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's probably going to be important to have that. And in terms of presence, then, when we're on our devices so much and, and in connection in certain kinds of ways, is that presence? Is it, would you call that presence? Not in the context. Of, I mean, my context was in a conversation. Um, presence. I think it is a presence because there. Are, I mean, there's lives happening, mm -hmm. and there's personality being formed, and you follow people who you don't even know, but they're in your mind. They're a certain mm -hmm. kind of presence. Mm -hmm. They have a presence there, mm -hmm. and so you. So I think there's different. There's different. So maybe it's a different quality of presence that you have. Yeah. I do think, and this isn't my own idea, but you've talked about it a bit, um, and the community of Louis C.K. You can like, brought it up in the recent video of how constantly being able to be connected to other people removes this like self-security of being, like it diminishes our ability to do things on our own mm -hmm. and reach conclusions on our own mm -hmm. constantly because 
we can check in with other people, feel that we have mm -hmm. to, before we can figure out how we feel about a situation or how to react to a situation. Mm -hmm. I think that's taken a, a major skill away from us. Mm -hmm. Who was that? Sherry Turkle? Is that her first name, Sherry? Mm -hmm. there, she, uh, Sherry Turkle wrote an op-ed recently pretty much about that, and that the minute we get bored, we can always look at our device and go on and do something so that we never have the experience, or we don't have it very much anymore, of just being with ourselves, being bored for a little while, to just see what arises, you know, see who are we, and, you know, when we don't have that kind of input coming in all the time. Yeah. Yeah, um, just a point about that. Uh, well, I think there's a, a certain sense of illusion of connection through mm -hmm. social media. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw this, there was a um, short uh, animated uh, clip that somebody had made about the loneliness behind in the age of social media and mm -hmm. made this point that was very point, like on point to me, which is the fact that we can edit, and like when we communicate via text <laughs> and email, we edit ourselves. Mm -hmm. We that through an editing process, so the communication isn't direct, it's not off the top of my head what I'm thinking. It goes through editing processes of what is more appropriate, so it, it gets distance from what you actually mean and what the actual raw communication that you're supposed to have. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very interesting, isn't it, to think about how we adapt. I mean, two of the kind of core qualities of a healthy individual are the capacity to adapt and the capacity to be flexible. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what we're being called on to do in these days now that we have social media and so many technological uh, ways mm -hmm. of staying connected and relating to each other in our world. Uh, so lots of it we see in places where people have had no voice and no visibility and we see the wonders of Twitter and where actually people can get their voice out in very oppressive societies. I mean, it's a whole, it's changed everything in so many ways. So, you know, there can be the underbelly of it and all the wonderfulness of it, but it'll be to, up to all of us to figure mm -hmm. out how do we stay in right relation as 21st century citizens to the ways the world is changing. And then with the empathy, how, what does it take to be empathic? It's, it's something that has a certain uh, requirement. Do you know what it is that it takes? Um, Brittany Brown did this video just mm -hmm. a while back. Oh, I saw that. Um, mm -hmm. And she talks about, I can't remember what, she, what the point she was making, but it was so wonderfully Yeah, done. it was. It was effective like, communication. Or not, if you don't remember. I don't remember. I don't remember. The animals were so cute. I remember those two animals. They were so cute. <laughs> 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 well, you know where I saw it? Which is a great resource. Oh, if you don't know about brain pickings. Oh, yeah. That site is just fabulous. And that's where I saw that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
car, and you know, what do I do now? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm sure that some people who've had those kind of tunnel visions are very happy as well. So it's not that that can't work, but certainly for for me, I, I was never that kind of person. I was an experienced junkie. I um, you know, joined the Army by accident. There was a recruiter that came into organic chemistry in Northern California in the late 70s. Not exactly a hotbed for military recruiting. <laughs> <laughs> and I just got it in my mind, no kidding, I could join the military and go to medical school. And it's all you need is a letter of acceptance. Well, two years later, I got that letter going back to my hometown in Loma Linda, California. I was going to meet with some high school buds. We were going to go out to Laguna Beach. I said, ah. I'll meet you guys there this afternoon. Didn't tell a soul. And went to Santa Monica on the way in and went into the military, you know, the, the recruiting bank. And I saw the different stations for each of the services. It never occurred to me I'd have to choose a service. I said, well, I only have time to you know, fill out one of these applications. The Army line was the shortest. Oh, no, no kidding. Way. So that's how I ended up in the Army. And so then once I, I got into medical school, going into psychiatry. Yeah. Had a presenta a series of presentations my first year by this child psychologist, Blake Kesey was his name, and he talked about this, this convergence now of what neuroscience is bringing forward, his passion, his love for patients, and how really it's the best of humanity and the best of science coming together at a very exciting level. I was just mesmerized. And I went into psychiatry. My, my medical school classmates still tease me this day, you know, so, or, you know, if it had been a urologist who had been on fire about, you know, would you have gone into urology? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> it really, you know, it remind. I, I still think back to the experience to remind myself of the importance of mentorship, of example, of just sharing with others, uh, particularly folks who are just kind of getting started themselves. To let you know, if, if you feel lost, you don't know exactly where you're going, but you, you, you know, you're you're on a journey. Great, mm -hmm. keep your eyes open because you never know what or who may uh, you may encounter on that journey. Now, Lori and I, speaking of odd encounters, we actually met through, and you wouldn't guess this in a hundred years, Gary Trudeau of Doonesbury. Yeah. <laughs> and Gary had reached out to me when I was minding my own business as a hospital commander at Fort Hood, Texas. Okay. Uh, early on in the conflict, probably 2004, 2005, and he wanted to get some help understanding PTSD. His character, yeah, right. BD, was just leaving Walter Reed, was now going to have to deal with the war with him. So we became battle buddies. And over the course of the next several years, he knew that I was looking for a set of skills that would be simple enough to be used in the community, peer to peer, but powerful enough to be effective so that we could keep troops and their families alive long enough to get them what they needed to reinstill hope, to give them purpose, and of course that work is still ongoing. I stayed in uniform as long as I, I, I possibly could, you know, making as much of the change as I could within the system with our team and the whole of the rest. And then I realized in 2010 it was time to get out because there were things that have to be done on the outside that can only be done on the outside. So Lori and I teamed up and as she said, you know, we, we you know, took the self-regulation skills that she and her colleagues have taken all over the world. We've, you know, used them with the military now. We've embedded them in a systems uh, model, the social resilience model, and that's really, in a nutshell, what's brought us here today. So, back to you, Lori. Yeah, so the, the, this individual level piece, which is what we use, and we still teach that piece, what we use, and you'll, you'll get it as a handout, so hopefully you won't have to, um, write it all down, but very simply, if we, a little piece of neuroscience is that we, if in our model we focus on the nervous system, and the nervous system of your body consists of your brain, your spinal cord, and then all the sensory nerves that go out to the environment. And when you think about it, the brain and the spinal cord are completely encased in your body. They don't have any independent access to the outer world, right? Your brain is encased in your skull, your spinal cord goes down your back, and so it, they're completely dependent on what kind of experience? Sensory. Sensory input. Sensory input. And so what 
we often say, or we often hear from people is, well, this is the missing link. This is the missing link to look at sensory level experience because in our culture particularly, we focus so much on cognition, thinking, and emotion, feeling, and we hardly pay attention to sensation, even though sensation is the language of the survival brain. And everything comes in as sensation. Before it's an emotion, it's a sensation. It's just that it gets translated in milli, milli, milliseconds into an emotion, which then gets translated into a thought, right? And so what we do is we intervene at the nervous system level, and our nervous systems are like so many other parts of nature, where it operates in a particular rhythm. So we have, like, what are some of the obvious rhythms in nature that you can think of? Flowing water. Hmm? Flowing water, especially the tides coming in and going out. Sunrise. 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 Yeah. Sunrise and sunset. What else? Hibernation, activity and rest, day and night. So we have, as creatures of nature, we have uh, cycles and rhythms inside our body. And one of them is the cycle, the rhythm, in your autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is uh, the part of your nervous system that really influences every organ in your body, which is why when people have experienced a traumatic event, they often experience physical symptoms. Like what? Digestion. Digestion. Lots of stomach aches we see. Hmm? Back of pain, headaches, Headache. absolutely. Sleep disruption. Hmm? Sleep disruption. Sleep disruption. That That's a really big one. And then that sleep disruption is a sort of gateway mm -hmm. symptom to all kinds of other things that, that are dysregulating. What about uh, cognition problems? Problems thinking. How do those show up? Foggy. Foggy. Memory. Mm -hmm. Memory problems, that's a big one. What sort of goes along with memory? We see this in kids in school. Anger and aggression. Kids often have, well that's a, that's a big sign of hyperarousal, yeah, that's one. But cognitively, what happens is um, attention problems. <clears throat> so it's not unusual for a child who has a trauma history a history of either chronic abuse or neglect, to show up in the classroom very distractible. And so that kid is often diagnosed with what? ADHD. ADHD and then put on uh, medication for attention deficit disorder. And not that there aren't kids that that can benefit, but if it's a kid who's really dysregulated because of, of trauma, they don't need to be on the medication for ADHD. And with adults, or even teenagers and above, what, what we start to see is that when this rhythm of the sympathetic, so there are two branches, let me just backtrack for a minute. There are two branches of the autonomic nervous system. One is the sympathetic branch, and that's like the accelerator on the car. It gives us our energy. And one is the parasympathetic part. It relaxes us. And so all day long, inside a certain zone, this rhythm is going on. So, you know, you can be sitting here and a friend comes in and you feel the rise of excitement or pleasure to see them, and then you relax again. And so it's going on below our level of consciousness all the time. And that's our life force. You know, that's our vitality, as long as it stays inside what we call a resilient zone. And when you're in your resilient zone, it means that your thinking, your feeling, and your sensations are all congruent. And you're capable of responding to what life is dishing out instead of being reactive. And to get back to the empathy piece, what we know is that when people are in high states of dysregulation, it's very hard for them to be compassionate. Because what happens is you sort of contract into a sort of scarcity mentality and become very self-focused because we are pretty much wired for survival. And in any situation of threat or fear, um, 
you know, we don't become our best selves usually, unless we have a very deep resilient zone. So we look at this rhythm, and then if a traumatic event or a traumatic trigger happens, it disrupts that nice gentle rhythm and it bumps it either out, the, here's the resilient zone, above, which is hyperarousal, and it shows up as pain, anxiety, agitation, paranoia, um, anger, rage, irritability, things like that. Or it spikes down below in hypoarousal as depression, exhaustion, numbness, dissociation, where you're sort of disconnected from your body. And then a lot of people, because our system is always looking for balance, if it's out of kilter, way up here, where does it have to go to get balance? Yeah, it has to go way down here. It can't just go here to get balance. So then people are swinging from here to here. And what do we call that? Bipolar, bipolar disorder. And it's not, again, it's not that bipolar disorder doesn't exist. It's just that it can be misdiagnosed in people who've suffered uh, traumatic events because their system is bouncing back and forth in a state of dysregulation. Just to, yes, I was just going to say, for clarity, like when, when you say somebody who's suffered traumatic events, mm -hmm. how severe are we talking about? That's a really, really trauma, good like question. Your, your parents yeah. mistreating you when you were a kid along some lines is enough to sort of set this incongruence going for your life, or are we talking like you were molested or something? Is there a difference? Well, we typically think in terms of three orders of distress. And we tend to use the word distress in our work with people rather than trauma because it's a provocative word. And so you can have what we call little d distress, which can be, you know, a fight with a loved one that's not threatening the relationship or, you know, what you spill your coffee on your best clean white shirt or something like that. Or you can have big d distress like war zone trauma, rape, you know, the kinds of things that we, most of us think about when you're asked what would be some examples of trauma. They tend to be those big ones. And then there's what we call cumulative distress, which is poverty, colonialism, um, uh, sexism, homophobia, any of those kinds of isms, ageism, all that kind of stuff where people live in a perpetual state of threat or fear because of some characteristic of, of their life or their country or whatever. War zones are, are typical. We don't all have the same depth of resilience zone, right? Some people are more vulnerable because of their past histories than others. Like, we do know that long-term meditators tend to have a pretty deep resilience zone. Why? Because they've had an attentional practice that has wired in the capacity to just hold whatever comes at them. Many of us don't have that, and lots of people that come through our uh, work have a lot of trouble meditating because they're so dysregulated that they can't settle down. And if they do, maybe they have um, uh, flashbacks, or they dissociate, or they have, you know, it's not, a, it's not what it's supposed to be. It's not an awareness practice for them. So what we what the goals of our individual level model are then is to take this and bring it back to this through a set of pretty easily learned skills um, that help people track in their bodies the sensory pattern and shift it. If any of you are interested in just getting acquainted with those skills, you can download um, the iChill app, that's just iChill. Uh, my contribution was the name. You may have gathered by this point that we have a left brain dominant Lori <laughs> and a right brain dominant Lori. Yeah. Would be me. And so between the two of us, we have one complete brain. <laughs> <laughs> so all of this neuroscience stuff is great. I love it. Yes. <laughs> and I tend to think in metaphors. And so maybe this will be useful for some of you. Um, if you think about it, in fact, a chaplain once came to one of our trainings, and at the end of the three days, he then went home and wrote a sermon and, and gave it that Sunday. And he came up with just a great metaphor, I think, and that is he said, you know, okay, I get this trauma, stress, distress stuff now. He says, it's kind of like when, you know, bad stuff happens and 
you know, your brain goes cattywampus, and it's a little bit like blowing a fuse. Mm -hmm. You know, and you can, when you're at home, you blow a fuse. He says, you know, you can either stomp around and rant and rave on the main level of the house, and you might feel a little bit better for a while, but if you really want things to get better, you have to go into the basement and reconnect the circuit breaker. So if you can just think about working at this level, at the survival brain level, with very simple skills, and you can learn about them in iChill. It's free. Download it, Android, Apple, whatever mm -hmm. computer platform you have. And through practicing those skills, you can reconnect your circuit breaker so that that, that sort of stuck energy that happens as the result of little d, big b distress, cumulative distress, you know, you can't talk it away. You can't medicate it away. You know, you, you and, 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 and what we're, we're finding now, particularly, you know, at the pace of life and the interconnectivity and of the demands that we're making every day on our mind-body systems, you, know, you don't have to go to a war zone or be in some catastrophic event uh, to be dysregulated. I mean, just the everyday stuff of life. And so it becomes all the more important to learn ways of self-care where you can, you know, keep your, keep your circuit breaker connected so that you can be your best self at, at, at all levels. Mm -hmm. Does that make some sense? And let, let's just stop for a moment and see uh, any questions, comments about that so far. Could you give an example of an exercise? I'm curious. Yeah, yeah. that's a good uh, uh, I thought you were going to do that little arms around each other. Oh, thing. good idea. Okay, let's try this. <laughs> Perfect question. <laughs> okay, just just take a, a few moments. I'd invite you just to kind of put your your arms around yourself, and uh, you can either keep your eyes open or closed, but just stay stay in that position for just a few a few moments. Yeah, and apply a, a gentle pressure so that you're really aware of the contact of your hands against your arms. Okay. And then you can just go ahead and uh, release your arms and come back to the here and now. Let me just ask out of curiosity, how many of you folks found that to be a, a pleasant experience? Okay, oh, wow. How many of you found it to be unpleasant? Wow, this is the first. This is amazing. This is a cuddly group. It's about half and half. In, in, yeah, it's yeah. sort of in a in a. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm loving this group already. But in in why well, we're just really stressing the event. <laughs> Night of the semester, as you're mentioning But for most groups, you know, they'll be usually close to half and half. Some folks will, you know, experience it as pleasant as, as you folks did, and other folks will just, you know, feel, no, that wasn't pleasant. It felt like I was being hemmed in. It felt constraining. I, I didn't like it at all. And the, the reason we, we like to do that... Um, well, wait, little, but then out, make them work a little harder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do you know what was pleasant? Like, what was going on inside your body at the sensation level that you know to call it pleasant? It felt like a hug, like somebody was mm -hmm. either comforting you or mm -hmm. protecting you or uh, like there for you. Uh -huh. Word the body relaxed. Okay, the, your body relaxed. And how did you notice the relaxation? I could feel it. Okay, and you're touching your shoulders. Right, right. You feel so you felt it in your shoulders. Okay, so relax, relaxation of tension. So that's one way. How about others? How did you know to call it pleasant? Breathing slowed down. Breathing slowed down. Okay, so see, now you're talking at the sensation level. Now you're reading your autonomic nervous system. And which part of the autonomic nervous system do you think you're reading? The one that calms you down. Which is which one? On our little the parasympathetic. I, I remember it as a parachute because they, you know how they drift down really gently and parachute parasympathetic. I guess that's occasionally the brain right brain gives a little exercise. Oh, is that a right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so at the sensation level, because most people want to 
uh, tell us what they thought. You know, well, I thought it, it reminded me of when my mother would make me put on a sweater over my head that was too tight and go into a long story or talk about that it felt scary or it felt, what did you use the word, constraining or constricting. Mm -hmm. But we want to help people get to the sensation level, and most of us don't have much of a vocabulary for a sensation because we don't relate at that level. So when we go through training with people, and if they give us a feeling, we'll say, well, how do you know to call it sad? Or how do you know to call it anxious? What's the sensation in your body? And they'll say, well, there's this fluttering in my chest. or there. And so as we work with them, they develop the capacity to pay attention at the sensory level. And remember, when you're learning to pay attention at the sensory level, then you're contributing to neuroplasticity in your brain. And so do you think we're going to, here's a good test question, do you think we're going to have them stay longer in the unpleasant sensations or in pleasant sensations? Unpleasant. Pleasant. Pleasant. Okay, how many pleasants? How many think pleasant? Will you repeat the questions? Or? Yes. <laughs> Do you think, this is your final exam question of the year, <laughs> your entire grade depends on your answer. <laughs> but are That's you stressed out now? Now that we've just regulated you. Yeah. Do you think that when you're working with someone, thinking about neuroplasticity, I'm giving you the hint. Do you think that you'd want to have them spend more time in an unpleasant sensation or in a pleasant sensation? Is it somebody who's experienced trauma? Yeah, or distress, let's call it. Pleasant. I would say pleasant. Pleasant. And why? Why? That's correct. Get comfortable with that feeling and know what that feels like and like be able to create associations with your sense perception and the feeling of positivity. And that's uh, all of that is completely true. And what else? Um, so that when he gets into the unpleasant feelings, he knows how, how to come back to the pleasant. Great. Yeah, that's right too. And then what are you doing though in the brain? Rewiring. Rewiring. You're rewiring the brain so that it has a greater hardiness for stress because you're you're um, strengthening the pathways that build parasympathetic relaxation capacity. So we, use, we work with little bits of distressing material alternated with bigger doses of relaxation material and their skills that do that. So why, why go to the unpleasant sensations? Because people often, the kinds of people we work with are not, they're either completely living in the negative because that's how we're wired. We have this little, and we have two of them, two little grape-shaped things in our brain called the amygdala that is wired to pick up either novelty in the environment, but, but particularly the kind of novelty that threatens you, your, your survival. It's just like if you have a little ache in your tooth, that's all you notice is that ache in your tooth. But in fact, if you shift your attention away from the ache in your tooth to a place in your body that isn't aching, the ache in your tooth, what do you think happens to it? It starts to diminish. So we want to help people learn to shift so that we can rewire their brain. Ultimately, what we're doing is not symptom management. It does that for people, but it is rewiring the nervous system so that their resilient zone gets deeper. And it takes a bigger stressor to get them out of that zone and then they have the skills that when they do get bounced out, to get back in. So let me give you an example. This was a Vietnam veteran who uh, had spent close to 40 years in the Los Angeles VA, meeting on a regular basis with, with his battle buddies, uh, tight bonds, they tell war stories, uh, but their lives were just awful hadn't changed in 40 years. And so this was, this was a pain unit, and they learned these skills over a period of uh, several weeks, weekly sessions, and he came back after one weekend and he relayed his experience. He said, uh, you know, he says, I found out that you know, one of the big hardware stores, maybe it was Lowe's, had a, had a veteran's discount. And he said, you know, I haven't been in a store for years. 
Uh, I've learned these skills. Let me, let me check this out. So he went and he got his stuff and he brought it to the checkout counter. He says, I'm a veteran. I'm here for my discount. And so the clerk says, oh, sir, I'm so sorry. The veteran's discount is only on Thursday and this is Saturday. <laughs> so he started to track. That's the overarching skill of this model. He's tracking the rage now that's starting to emanate from the depths of his mind. He puts his hands on the counter. He's now grounding himself. It's an ancient skill, but he's grounding himself. He's sensing into the support of the, the counter on him against his hands. He then shifts his attention to his feet, and he's now grounding himself. He's, he's sensing into the support the firmness of the floor underneath his feet. So in other words, he was tracking that he was in danger of getting bummed out here, right? So by, by grounding himself and then resourcing, he had a resource, his granddaughter, he took out his smartphone and he could see her picture. And by grounding and resourcing, he was able to stay within his resilience zone and ask very calmly, I'd like to speak with your manager. The manager came out, he explained it, only, and the manager then said, well, you know, that makes really a lot of sense. Mm. It should be every day for veterans. He was able to make store-wide policy. <laughs> <laughs> and he came back to talk and tell the story. And he said, you know, he said, before, he said, the reason I didn't go into stores is as soon as that clerk said what she said, I would have been over the counter, after her neck, they would have called security, I would have ended up in jail. I mean, there was a very good reason why he didn't go <laughs> yeah. into stores or, you know, uh, subject himself and others to his, his volatility. Mm -hmm. But you can see just with these very simple skills and the practice of them. So as Lori said, your, your, your resilience zone gets deeper. It gets harder to get, you know, bumped out. Mm -hmm. But it's really, you know, developing the capacity to track at any given time. Where am I in that resilience zone? You know, for many of us, it's so easy, particularly the middle of the week or the end of the uh, uh, semester. You know, however deep our, our resilience zone is, it's so easy to just, you know, we start noticing, for example, a friend of mine, she's a wife of a four-star general. I remember once she came and she says, she says, what's going on with me? I'm managing all of these things every single day and doing just great. And then I go into the PX, the, the grocery store, and they're out of avocados, and I burst into tears. <laughs> right? Have we ever had an experience like that? Yeah. Well, that's a good sign that we're living a little too close to our <laughs> A good sign for the need for a little self-care to kind of get us back down into the middle of that resilience so. so it can be a lot of fun with kids. I mean, you know, the kids in Haiti with the... the yeah. We've know, developed the a set of games that mimic the rhythm of the healthy, the resilient nervous system, so that there is a period of um, activity for arousal, and then a period that's calming, you know, arousal, calming, arousal, calming, and you can design any kind of game if it has four ingredients, activation, calming, cooperation, and safety. And safety is, for me, the longer I've been in this kind of work, the more I realize that Safety drives the bus in our brain. And if you have a perception of a lack of safety, and it only has to be a perception, it does not have to be real even, um, that you're not safe, that you're threatened in some kind of way, all kinds of things start to happen in the mind-body system that, again, make it very difficult to be compassionate and to be constructive and all those things that we all would like to think that, that we are. And so maybe that also leads into then, so we had this package of skills to work with people at the individual level and teach them how to work with other people at the individual or group level. I mean, we've done uh, the tracking and grounding with huge groups of people, but we really wanted to do more. I mean, it's again, it's that thing about, let's take it further then, if, if it works at this level, how big can we get it so that we have an even bigger impact? Um, well, to, to take on the challenge of working within systems, whether they be neighborhoods or healthcare systems or schools, but you know, it's one thing to, to develop skills and to, to, to deepen your own resilience, and that has tremendous uh, you know, positive impact. 
But if you're living in a toxic family or you're, you know, in a toxic work environment or a system of any kind, it becomes very, very challenging as an individual to uh, really maintain your, your balance and your equanimity. And so that's why we, we developed the social resilience model, which aims at, you know, anytime we go into a system, we work with all levels of leadership. So top-down leadership, and the top-down leaders need to drive it. So it's not just something that, yeah, you know, take this and, and see if you can get yourself some help. No, top-down. Uh, people up, you know, grassroots, as well as those essential middle out leaders um, who develop, you know, a common lexicon. So you're talking about, you know, with families, for example, it's not at all uncommon as, as kids learn uh, uh, these skills in this way of, of talking to be able to track their own parents. Mom, you are stuck on high right now. I think you need a little drink. You know, it, it, it's, it becomes fun. But if you're going to transform a system, it's, it's imperative that, that you work with all levels of that system and then recognize that um, there are ways in which a system can have a nervous system of its own. And that's the slide, I th the, the sheet I think you have in, in color. But just think about some of those ways. You know, here Lori sketched this out on an individual level. But what are, the, what are the things that you might imagine for a system that's been bumped out of its resilient zone and is stuck on high? What are the kinds of behaviors or uh, attitudes or things that happen within a system like that? Violence. Violence. We'll look at bullying in our in our in all kinds of systems, not just in schools with no. kids, but in um, across all kinds of work settings too. That's a form of that dysregulation. You know, related to that, I I uh, learned recently about a phenomenon. You know, bullying is when one person sort of takes on targets another in a system. Then there's this also this phenomenon called mobbing, where an institution then targets an individual, uh, incredibly destructive uh, process, uh, which we're just starting to learn more and, and more about. But but you're right. Uh, maybe one or two other. What what would you say, Lori? Any other say, thoughts? Is it, how about substance abuse? I mean, is there something so, about trying to numb so that out people or, within the system, yeah. uh, right? And and maybe so, as related to that, maybe there's a level of denial in the system where people. When they try to bring up what what is actually happening, mm -hmm. maybe there's a you know a distance, mm -hmm. a, a detachment from that. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. All right. There are lots of behaviors that go along with faulty thinking, distorted thinking, mm -hmm. with emotions like rage. Mm -hmm. You know, when we went into China, we said to people in the systems we were working with a lot of teachers and uh, medical students and so forth that we said, you know, if people don't learn how to regulate themselves, we guarantee you're going to see this huge spike in family violence. It just happens because the system is dysregulated, and that's what starts to happen, is people start to hit each other and, you know, do all kinds of things that they wouldn't have done um, from inside that zone. You know, what about systems in which it's, you know, have you ever been in a system where it just hasn't been safe to speak the truth? Right? It just has a toxic effect. When, when you're not safe to, to speak the truth, um, boy, bad things happen, that happen in a hurry. Well, think of the uh, teenager in Afghanistan who was shot for uh, advocating for women's right to education. You know, what's, what is her name? Um, oh, she oh, yeah, she has a book out now that's like number six on the bestseller list. Talk about courage, but living in a system where it was very dangerous to speak out. Um, and what do you do in those systems where speaking the truth is? is you know, if you and, and that's where I mean, this is just sort of a whole new burgeoning realm of of in, endeavor. If you have access to a system where the leadership is open to, uh, you know, learning different ways of of for example, self-regulating, you know, learning about these uh, sort of basic ways of, of, of re-regulating at the individual level, and then the individuals form what we call a collaborative intelligence and support networks to, to continue that process of keeping, you know, individually deepening their resilience zone as well as within the, the, the system. Uh, the problem comes, of course, 
in that in many systems, the top-down leadership is, is not willing or open to that. The good news, however, is that, you know, with technology and with the, you know, the, the access that people now have to knowledge, there's a whole different level of power dynamics that uh, is disrupting the traditional sort of top-down lid, which gives me great hope and, and, and you know, uh, courage looking at the future. But it's a question that we're wrestling with right now in terms of just trying to figure out how can we scale this? How can we, how can we bring this approach to uh, different systems, regardless of whether the top-down leadership is, is, is open to it? And in neighborhoods, for and example, this working. neighborhood project, yeah. it, the whole key, I think, is safety. And if you can create a sense of safety, and how do you think you do that across neighborhoods of diverse groups who don't know each other very well? I mean, what, what idea as sort of social designers would you have? Or what do we need to do to weave people together in ways that enhance safety? I've, I've lived on Capitol Hill for um, hmm. 25 years, and we had a Moms on the Hill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Listserv. Yes. It's a listserv. It's yeah. So old, right? It had 1,400 members, 1,500 members, mm -hmm. and um, it was it was really interesting the way that that operated because you would not only get news about what was literally happening right that moment mm -hmm. in the community, but you could say, "I need a doctor for X, Y, Z. I need a you know," and like even though you didn't know these people because they were on this list, you would get this information. You could act on it. And it was very, like, um, just it made you feel good to be in that space. Yeah, yeah. Then you feel like you belong, yeah, right. you know, that you're known. It's hard to be connected. We mm -hmm. have a human need. We have a social brain, a mind-body system that needs to be connected to, to Like, I have this fantasy that we're going to be able to find someone, and maybe it's one of you, to design a game that would be played across neighborhoods that would be competitive in a positive sense of the word, but that neighborhoods would play that would weave them together. So I think that what we need in, our, in this project in Boston to build in are not only uh, ways that the neighborhood uh, can use these skills, which is going to be the foundation of what we're applying for grant money for, but also how do we develop and use technology in a way to enhance safety, to enhance people's gifts? Like, could we have a listserv-like thing on an app where the, each household in a neighborhood would be surveyed for what they would be willing to give to their community? Like, maybe somebody has a cornbread recipe. Maybe somebody get, knows something about auto mechanics. Maybe somebody would be willing to walk a dog. You know, something where every single person feels a sense of efficacy and usefulness and dignity. And how do you, so we don't, we aren't here tonight and saying, well, we have the whole curriculum worked out, but we do have the neuroscience template for how do you build safety, because as you build safety, then you start to create the capacity for compassion and collaborative working. And so that's how you do it at the systems level. Yeah, it reminds me, it, or what came to mind was the Giuliani, um, you know, cleaning up the streets. There was the mm. phenomenon when he, you know, got rid of the... Broken windows. Yeah, and windows. no judgment about whether it was right or wrong, but the broken windows mm -hmm. thing. And then the crime rates dropped and everything. And there, it feels like just a perception of safety. Yeah. It so might have been a part of what played into Absolutely. Well, and, you know, another part of that, yes, there was the design element of knowing that, you know, when you take care of environments yeah. and have pride in them, mm -hmm. then it brings out, brings out a different kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was part of it. Also, what uh, he did was he took his uh, police chiefs mm -hmm. and he, ex he held weekly meetings where he exposed all of the data. Mm -hmm. So rather than them, you know, Rather than the police chiefs being rewarded for bragging about, about how nothing happened in their area and sort of hunkering down like this, they said, listen, you know, the, 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 the criminals don't care about you or yeah. you or you. Let's look at the whole set of data. Where are the clusters? Where are the patterns? How can we, by working together as a system, address the issue of, of criminal activity? 
So another app that's related to this is a friend of ours developed. Her name is Nancy oh, Schwartzman. Wow. She has a company called Tech for Good. And she won uh, Vice President Biden's contest for the design of an app that would reduce uh, sexual assault on college campuses. And it's called Circle of Six, and it's oh, yeah. also yeah. free. It's yeah. fabulous. And what you do is you, Circle of Six, you have a six people from your contacts list that you put into your circle. And then the phone, the app, is programmed with pre-programmed text messages like, I need a phone call right now. I need, I'm need. i in a difficult situation. Date going weird. Please call. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, it steps up to in more and more threatening situations like, come and get me. And all, they have, all the person has to do is hold their phone in their lap and push a button. It has a GPS in it. So it sends a text message out to everybody on the contact list and where the person is. And so then it's interesting to think about, well, what if you don't have six people on your contact list? And what do you do then? And how do you talk to your contact list? Like they, she has, I, as I understand it, a whole protocol about how if I want you on my list and you're in my book, this is what I have to understand. you and I talk about it together, so we're creating a bigger relationship field, right? And you agree and then maybe you put me in on your circle of six and pretty soon we have these networks of people who are um, sort of standing for the safety of each other. And I think we can do that on the community level too. So that's what we're interested in doing is developing this notion of a neuroscience template for building community resilience. Communities of really any size. And frankly, that's what brought us to New York. And if we hadn't come to New York, we never would have <laughs> run into Cheryl. <laughs> and we never would have Thanks come. I mean, time. so I had Have you uh, thought about doing it using schools? Oh, oh yeah. Schools? And it has been done in schools yeah. by people who've trained with Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Because I think it would be really valuable. Oh, no. Yeah. This, there's, in fact, it's on our website, this uh, woman's thesis. She agreed to let us put it on the website. Jean Berg, her name is, used it with third graders. Um, it's been used in children's right. hospitals for uh -huh. pain management. It's been used in lots of places, not by us anymore, because enough people have been trained in the model. But, you know, our real passion these days is to try to think creatively outside of our own box of what we've done successfully with it, but how do we, how do we make it bigger? And, and using science, and we do give people neuroeducation, not just left brain dominant people either. <laughs> because it motivates people. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. When Fun. people start to understand why we're teaching them a skill called sensory tracking, and why, what paying attention at the sensory level can do to rewire their brain, they're much more motivated to practice the skills than if it just seems like, you know, something that doesn't have science underneath it. And when we went to Haiti, um, this very, like, world famous neuroscientist said to me, you're going to teach those people about the autonomic nervous system, you know, those people? And let me just tell you that in Haiti, which has a 72% illiteracy rate, Everybody in our training easily learned about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic part of their nervous system. And they took to all that understanding so well. And they, I mean, I was so appalled to hear that from someone. And it felt so good to, and some of our materials were in stick figures, you know, so, so people didn't have to read much of it. But they learned how to do the skills based on the stick figure drawings. This graph has been drawn in the sand, in the dirt, <laughs> in the air, all, all over the world. And in fact, a great uh, example from Haiti was this young 14-year-old girl who showed up at the first training session and insisted, you know, she wasn't there with her mother. She was there because she wanted to learn these skills. And so she got the skills training, and then in a subsequent visit, this was over a period of two years, she told the story of how one of her buddies at school had a headache, and so she went through the skills of you know, tracking, grounding, resourcing, taught her the skills, and, and the headache went away. And the principal found out about it, 
and was then having them train all of the kids oh, in the high school. Mm -hmm. By the time the project was over, they were training all of the high schools in Port-au-Prince. Oh. I mean, it's just it's just great fun to be able yeah. to mm -hmm. animate and mobilize and you know and to shift the lens from pathology with all of the stigma and mm -hmm. the shame and the isolation to biology, where you oh that's how it works. That's how it works. That's how we're designed. And you can motivate people at the sort of corporate level by saying, you know, it decreases burnout, it decreases staff turnover in hospital systems, it can decrease medical error, it can decrease bullying, there's a big problem with bullying in hospitals. So um, all you have to do is talk about it from a human capital point of view, um, and people start to get interested, like, okay, well, we want that. So... Well, maybe this, you know, what might be, I'm mindful. We're almost 20 after 7, so yeah. I know we're just at, stepping over the bounds of your time limits, mm -hmm. and we know you guys have... Uh, well, any other any other comments, questions, ideas? Uh, I thought it would be nice for you to maybe close with uh, yeah, okay, your... Well, well, what about the 9-11 one? Think, think on that for a moment. We've got yeah. an idea right here. Yes. Oh, I have a question. Um, there, I mean, there's a lot of ways to sort of... In, like measure safety, I'm just wondering what types of metric you use to measure, not metrics, but just what are good indicators of social safety. Mm, that's a great question. Well, it's, it's, you know, increasingly we can have physiological um, monitoring of people, which is really a great breakthrough in science because we, and, and we use, um, we're going to be using these bracelets like the Jawbone Up bracelet. Mm -hmm. How many of you have seen that? Mm -hmm. It's a great, it's a great thing that monitors mm -hmm. sleep, mm -hmm. it monitors um, exercise, and it ha so it monitors that without you having to do anything. And then it also has a sliding scale for mood that's self-report. Mm -hmm. So that you can use um, sleep and exercise as proxies for things because so much depends on them. Mm -hmm. But you can also use um, saliva tests and things like that to see if people are in distress or not. And then the self-report of people. So for at the, like, the social, more at, like the larger level, mm -hmm. would you use just like a synthesis of all of that information? Well, plus you you'd use the engagement. Talk about that Gallup thing. That's yeah. such a useful. Yeah, you know, you you could absolutely use any or all of them, sort of in combination. But another. Uh, uh, body of, of research, which I think is really fascinating, was developed by the Gallup uh, company, and this is over hundreds and thousands of, of uh, individuals in the in the workplace that they've worked with companies all over the world. And so, some of you may have wondered, um, maybe some of you have remembered, do you ever remember when, when um, oh, there's Best Buy, what was the uh, Circuit City? Remember when Circuit City and Best Buy, you, you, you seem like you'd see one of them, each of them on, on practically every quarter, right? They, they were kind of a, a parody. Did, did you ever wonder, wonder why all of a sudden you didn't see Circuit City anymore? Well, that was <laughs> so hard. But uh, Best Buy, by the way, is now having their own struggles as more and more commerce has gone to the, the internet. But the, 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 um, the corporate leaders of Best Buy came to Gallup and said, listen, we, we want to clobber the market. We want to take over. Uh, market share, and we think we can do it, but we need we need some help. So, Gallup went and gave you know their their um, uh, surveys that they've developed over the years, and they came back and they said, well, do you realize that only three out of every ten employees um, in your company answers yes to what we have found to be the most predictive question, and that is, are you able to give your best at work every day? And the senior executive leaders were really taken back. You've got to be kidding. Only three out of ten? And, I, you know, and of course, when you look at data like that, it raises a different level of conversation, right? Because immediately, they said, well, we give them training. We give them the, you can give people all of that stuff, but it's a very different question. Can you give, do you feel safe enough? Do you feel like you can give your best at work every day? It's an engagement question. So Best Buy then said, well, help us with that, because we're going to lead this from the top, we're going to lead it throughout the organization, we're going to do whatever it takes. And so uh, they, you know, developed a program, they, they said, you know, our goal is, over the next 10 years, we want to double that from 3 to, you know, 30% to 
Well, because they had the senior most leadership in on this and they permeated throughout the entire organization and they had transparency. So the company knew, you know, people knew, you know, what was going on and, 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 and what they had to learn different skills. They, I mean, it, le it was a whole different level of engagement at all levels of the company. They were able to double from 30 to 60 percent in four years. So that's another way, you know, the human resources departments, I mean, that's one of the projects we're working on right now. They've done the baseline uh, data testing with the Gallup, Q, they call it the Q12 engagement uh, survey. It's a very simple survey, but they've really distilled it. They've honed it over the years to really focus on that critical uh, question of engagement. So community surveys is engagement. That would, absolutely, absolutely. Right. All right, you all. One more. Yes. Um, from what I remember, like, and this might be wrong from my like, past life of mine as a science, um, the brain, a, chi a child's brain hasn't hard, like, sort of been hardwired as much as an adult. So, does that influence the way you guys teach? Absolutely. children versus adults these techniques mm -hmm. and how do you prepare children to change their understanding of it as they get older Great question. with kids we do it through games and then we teach other kids how to work with each other so I mean really little kids like three years old you can't do that you just teach it through a game and you teach it through the parents so, for example, one of the games we've used is with a parachute. You have kids all around it, and, and remember there were four components. There was the activation, the calming, there's the cooperation and safety. So, you get the kids in there, you know. Well, first you teach them sensory tracking. Yeah, you That's the skill that you have to use for all the other skills in our model. And you set up the rules for safety so that anyone at any time wants to, you know, get off the, sh you know, let go of the sheet. They can let go of the sheet, and you know, no one's going to get hurt in this game. No Except crashing into anybody. No anyway. crashing, right? <laughs> <laughs> and 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 then it, it's just, you know, so then the kids start, you know, they have to cooperate to, to you know, lift the parachute at the same level. And then you start going a little faster. Then you slow it down. And then uh, the social part of it, um, the cooperation also would be at one point to lift the parachute and step and say hello and come back. Okay. So the kids have a great, and adult kids have a great time with this as well. But it's very, you know, interesting because you can assess the level of dysregulation by seeing which of the kids, adult or otherwise, you know, either can't really summon the energy to keep up with the, the increase or get going so fast that when it slows down, they, get, they can't slow down. They're dysregulated. So it's a great diagnostic without yeah, people yeah. knowing they're being diagnosed. Yeah. And so what do we do then? Do we take that kid who's, you know, just regular, and we take him out here and have him sit with a psychiatrist for a while? No! <laughs> we Give grab him a pill? We no. grab his buddy, and we, you know, sit down in the dirt or wherever we are, and then we just, we, we, we work or with them, with them and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, to help them. Uh, develop the capacity through games, you know, a little more intensive uh, work so that they can get back, you know, get back to a level of regulation so that they can be their best selves. And we try to use the games that come out of a culture, too, and yeah. sometimes we just have to have the people help us adapt the games um, so that they fit the model of, of activation, calming, activation, calming, and things like that. So that's yeah. one example of how we use it with kids. The best thing you can do with kids is teach the parents or the primary caregivers um, how to do it, and then they do it with each other, and it, then it gets reinforced. Mm -hmm. And as they get older, for example, a nice way, a nice adaptation for adolescents is to, you know, put something, you know, in the middle of the, the parachute. So let's say what? Um, Sometimes it's that, a scarf or a yeah, and not a ball. Yeah, like a ball, something that isn't going to hurt anyone, but the, the challenge then becomes to keep that ball on the parachute. And again, you can the same thing, you can see who's having difficulty stopping, you know, slowing down, who's having difficulty starting, you know, are they stuck on high, stuck on low? And so it just becomes a fun way of Well, plus when you're moving your joints, the, a lot of traumatic energy gets stored in the joints. And so having exercises and activities for people where they're using large muscles and joints helps also release traumatic activation. So 
even if we're there for three days in a particular IDP camp, let's say, and that we play that game with the kids a couple of times a day, and we teach it to them so they can play it after we leave. And we, we used parachutes in, in Thailand, and then we stopped using them because we didn't want to leave the parachute behind because this guy's mother had made it for him to take. So then we started using queen-size sheets, and then we leave the sheet behind, and then they can keep using it afterwards. So always, always the goal is to teach it and leave it behind, and leave it behind with a rationale for why it's being used so people are motivated to keep using it. Okay, so we, I don't know if this is the thing you wanted me to do, the, the but... The poem 9-11 uh, that you were sharing with that women's group as that sort of transported out of your life? Oh, that. Yeah. That. I was going to read, <laughs> yeah. read this FDR thing. I I'll read this. that one and you tell right, you read that. <laughs> <laughs> Flexible, adaptable. <laughs> <laughs> and I that I'd let her take it right away from me. <laughs> When I, I went to a um, work practice program at the Upaya Zen Center before I lived in Santa Fe. And so I'd been there for a whole month. And I flew back to Washington where I lived and where my private practice was on September 10th, 2001. So the night before that, that happened and remembering also that it hit, uh, the, one of the planes hit the Pentagon. So it was right in my city. And um, when and the morning of September 11th, I, had, I was just wrapping up a women's therapy group. And I was sharing with them uh, something that I had learned while I was at Upaya. And it goes like this. And I, the, the horrible irony is I was saying this as the pl first plane was hitting the first World Trade Center tower. And it goes, let me respectfully remind you, life and death are of supreme importance. Time passes swiftly, and opportunity is lost. Awaken, awaken, take heed. Do not squander your life. So I had heard that as I left a month of, you know, being wrapped in the womb of a Zen practice. Mm -hmm. And the next week when the women came back, they just said, I can't believe you taught that to us when that was happening, you know. And, it, you just couldn't help, but I think our whole, the whole world probably collectively um, needed to be reminded, you know, the, of the preciousness of life and that we are each here to make our own version of a contribution, right? Mm -hmm. So we certainly give you our best wishes for your contribution. And, um, and you don't have to read that if you don't want to. We hear it. But now you want to hear it, right? This is a thing from FDR. We grew up in Hyde Park recently and went through both the Eleanor Roosevelt oh, Museum as well as the family. Wonderful. Just incredible. And so here's a quote uh, by President uh, Roosevelt, FDR. The country needs, and I would say the world, the world needs, and unless I mistake its temper, the world demands bold, persistent experimentation. It is common sense to take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it frankly and try another. But above all, try something. And that's paired with Eleanor's quote, which I just love. You must do the thing you think you cannot do. So, gang, let's get after it. that's so beautiful is that don't ask what the world needs. Yeah. You know that one? Ask what makes you come alive and do it. Because the world needs people who've come alive. That's a great word. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. Your very last class of the semester.